Hi, everybody. My name is Mandy Irvin, and I am the Economic Mobility Program Manager with United Ways California. We are here celebrating the end of Cali ITC week, which is so exciting. So you might be wondering, what is the Cali ITC? So the Cali ITC, or the California Earned Income Tax Credit, is a tax credit for those that earn between one and $30,000 have lived in the state of California for at least half the year and have a social security number or an ITIN. And those who qualify can get thousands of dollars back in their tax return. And what's really, really exciting is those with ITINs are actually eligible, which is super exciting. So those with an ITIN can get the Cali ITC or the Young Child Tax Credit. We're excited to have a huge variety of people come and join us today, including Senator Caballero, Senator Rubio, we have State Controller Betty Yee, our Treasurer uh, Fiona Ma, we also have like our local United Ways, we have awesome community members, volunteers, whole bunch of great people to really share insight with you all on why we care so much about this and why we want you guys to learn about the Cali ITC. So to kick things off, um, we're gonna uh, have four different uh, sections of panelists. And in our first section, we have uh, State Controller Betty Yee, our Policy and Advocacy uh, Director, Anna Hasselblad. And then we have this amazing ambassador from the Bay Area, Rachel Reese. Thank you so much for joining us. So my first question is, I'm going to start off with you, Controller Yi. Thank, thanks again for joining us. Um, as state, as the state's chief fiscal officer, you chair the Franchise Tax Board. Tell us your thoughts on how the California tax system can and should be leveraged for greater economic equity in the Golden State. Yeah, thank you, Mandy, and thank you to United Way for being such a wonderful partner with the state of California. You know, as I think about the tax system and uh, really how it is to support uh, really the strength of our economy and our economy continuing to grow for and be inclusive of everyone has a huge role to play uh, in terms of how we can uh, have it work for uh, helping us achieve greater economic equity. And uh, I look at these programs that you've just described, Kelly ITC and the Young Child Tax Credit, as being critical uh, to uh, what we can do to further that uh, that goal. Uh, it is, uh, I consider these to be really uh, some very fundamental income supports. And when you think about equity, and I'll just speak from a woman's perspective, we know what has happened to so many women during this pandemic with respect to work. And, and then just to add on top of that, the uh, systemic historic, um, you know, inequities with respect to, you know, gender pay gaps and, and all of that, and just what these programs can do in terms of uplifting uh, the ability of these women, and, and in most cases, children as well. Uh, to be able to uh, have a little bit of that economic burden eased off of their daily lives. And so um, I like to say as the Chief Fiscal Officer of California, we're the fifth largest economy in the world, and our, the strength of our economy really rests in the financial health of every single Californian. And these tax credits are critical, critical, critical supports uh, for so many Californians who are just looking to uh, not only uh, just make up for lost ground because of maybe losing a job or other circumstances that have come up, but certainly to be able to uh, be a part of this economy as it continues to grow. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. You know, I love hearing the stories from our Vita sites across the state. And I think what's really interesting, a lot of times when you ask people, what are you spending the money on? It's not anything crazy. They're spending the money on food, on rent. Right, on exactly. Bills. So that's right. money that people really need. Absolutely, absolutely. And then I think, uh, and, and we're very thrilled about having, you know, really the federal government step in with, um, you know, similar support. So this is really having, making a meaningful difference in terms of lifting people out of poverty, and uh, particularly children. And I'm so glad that you uh, talked about the two tax credits in California, because they do work in tandem. And uh, we know that it is making a difference for so many Californians across the state. Absolutely. And that's the perfect segue to my next question for Anna. So, um, the United Way's real cost measure report found that one in three families in the state of California are living below the real cost measure. Can you tell us what this means? Yes. So this means that a staggering 3.5 million families uh, struggle to earn enough for the most basic standard of living in the Golden State. So what that what that 3.5 million turns into is about three, it's about, sorry, it's about 2.5 times the official poverty statistic that we usually hear 
in conversation, in policy discussions, et cetera. It's a lot higher than the standard poverty measure. Um, it also means that about 2.5 million households of color are struggling to meet living costs in California. That includes 1.7 million Latinx families and over 260,000 Black families. They are unable to cover a basic standard of living in California. Um, the reason the real cost measure is so different from the standard poverty measure is because the real cost measure is a basic needs approach. It takes into account all of the real costs of living, hence its name. Uh, things like food, housing, transportation, childcare, out-of-pocket expenses, all the things that families typically use, things like the Cali ITC or the Young Child Tax Credit to help them afford. Um, and the real cost measure really also conveys an accurate sense of the hardship faced by so many families um, in different compositions, different family sizes, different age groups. Um, but it's a much clearer picture of California families. And it provides really like an insight to what families are facing, not just for families and communities themselves, but also for decision makers. It's really critical to have an accurate picture of what families are um, encountering on a day-to-day -day basis and how they're budgeting their, uh, their household. So one in three families below the real cost measure tells us where we as decision makers, leaders, community members need to go in our policy decisions moving forward. Things like establishing a minimum Cali ITC for all eligible tax filers is a great starting point, something that we're working on in 2022. So it's a really good indicator. It's a hard fact, but it's a really good indicator of where we need to move. Yeah, it's such a great point. I think we have a lot of families that they might not be considered living in poverty, right? And I think what the real cost measure does a great job of is showing that, you know, we have families who are working and it's still not enough. So if you guys are interested in learning more about the real cost measure, you can go to our website, unitedwayca.org, and you guys can actually see a breakdown county by county. What, what do things look like in your county um, compared to the one next door to you? So controller Yi. What role do you think community-based organizations and nonprofits have in helping families navigate the tax system? Oh my goodness, uh, we couldn't do it without them. Um, you know, I think for so many of the families who could benefit from these tax credits, uh, really helping them to access them. And, you know, these are true benefits that will help them. And so much of the time, you know, government uh, has um, an inability to really reach into those really hard to serve communities. And these community-based organizations, nonprofit organizations, uh, they become really the conduit and the trusted sources for many of these communities that may not necessarily have had a, any kind of working relationship with government, uh, really don't understand how the programs work, but to be able to go and uh, to their local community organization uh, with people who speak their language, with um, you know, people who are providing services to, to them and their families, families, um, they are critical, critical partners uh, in terms of helping us be sure that these benefits are being accessed. And then that's just, it's not just a one-time uh, relationship uh, about accessing the benefits. It's about a long-standing relationship that then is uh, uh, continuing to look at um, uh, how we can uh, also help facilitate other improvements in people's lives. Yeah, Controller Yi brings up such a great point. We're going to talk about it later in our webinar. We have a uh, VITA volunteer who's been volunteering for a really long time. So we're going to talk about what role does VITA play in helping people access tax credits and being able to do their taxes for free. We also have some more partners that will be joining us later in the call that'll be talking a lot about, you know, what do they do to really wrap their arms around families and really, you know, offer these, this holistic approach uh, with the families that they're working with. Um, so next time I'm, I'm going to ask a uh, question to Rachel Reese. Rachel Reese is our wonderful ambassador from the Bay Area. And I'd love to hear, you know, as you know, somebody who's living in California, you're a parent, you have children. Can you tell us what it's like raising a family in California? And what are some of the struggles that families are facing on a regular basis? Uh, um, raising a family in California, it's been a struggle. And it has been since I moved here to California from Harlem, New York, 30 years ago with my daughters and son. Rent, gas, public transportation, food, and out-of-pocket costs for dental and vision is unbelievably high and no longer affordable to families in the Bay Area. Um, the struggles that families, as well as myself, are facing on a daily basis today it is, and as well as foster care system families, um, we're all at risk 
of homelessness, um, low income, affordable housing, rent is based on the median income in the Bay Area. The percentage should be 35% of the family's income, but in turn, it is 60 through 100% plus of the family's income. When in reality, our living wages are way below the poverty level. So, you know, this is something that we, way before the pandemic we have experienced. And now it's a mass of people that are experienced this. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is, you know, you know, people are working and it's still not enough, right? We're still living paycheck to paycheck, the cost of housing and groceries, medical, all those things. It's a lot. And, you know, Rachel, what I would love for you to share with everybody is, you know, you've talked a lot about what it's like to raise a family in California, <laughs> but I also know that you worked with United Way Bay Area and they were really able to help you. Can you tell us about, you know, what program you were in, involved with and how it helped you? Yes. So um, United Way has helped me overcome these barriers with education through SparkPoint at, at Kenyatta College and a host of United Way Bay Area employees. United Way has helped me to understand the importance of education when it comes to credit scores and using everyday resources such as 211, getting my taxes done free by way of VITA, which is the Volunteers Income Tax Assistant, and engaging with officials as yourselves, keeping us all accountable to ensure laws change to make a difference in changing systemic inequality. It's when I first started with uh, United Way, my credit score literally was 532. It is now 699. So because wow. of the education and the resources that are available, it is helpful. What I say to others, don't be afraid to ask for help. There's so much help out there um, connected with United Way. So when you need help, always ask someone because there will be someone that could guide you to get help to make the difference and make your life a lot better. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rachel. And, you know, for those of you that are watching, we have United Way partners all over the state. So even if you're not in the Bay Area, there's probably United Way near you. So if you go to our website, unitedwayca.org, you can actually say, find a United Way near me. So you can look on our map and you can see who's near you. There's so many wonderful programs. SparkPoint is actually a great example of a program that's offered in um, a variety of different places across the state. So um, they help a lot with financial literacy, like Rachel was saying, but even more so than that, really helping people become financially independent, which is so important. So to wrap things up, we're almost done with our first uh, quarter of the hour. Um, Controller Yee, I would love to hear from you and then uh, Anna, you as well. How can we support Californians to reach their financial goals and feel empowered during the process? Yeah, great question, Mandy. Well, I think um, Rachel's our living example, a, a, a live example today about why it's so critical to continue to support uh, these tax credit programs and other uh, types of supports. You know, when I think about uh, just some of the stories that I have heard about um, just why these credits are important and that we're putting money into the pockets of low income families. It's, uh, it can make the difference in terms of being able to just take time off to uh, pursue a job training program or to look at even doing a, a search for a different job, uh, just to have a little bit of breathing room so that uh, you know they have that ability to just do the basic things of how to improve upon their financial situation. And I just have to say to Rachel, and for so many families here in California, thank you for not giving up on California. Um, you know, it's through wonderful programs like this that we really are committed to trying to build an economy that is inclusive of everyone. And for me, I will say, that um, you know the ways that we can help. You look at how these credits are helping in people's lives. We need to be sure that that help is stays 
uh, provides a permanent impact. Uh, and by that, I mean, uh, we want to be sure that that support is there for as long as people need it. Uh, we want to be sure that uh, as we're as they're dealing with issues around housing, uh, with respect to health care, child care, you know, just all of those supports that people need to be full participants in our economy and our society, that we are looking at this holistically. And really at the core of this is just to be able to uh, know that families have this really important uh, financial support in Cali EITC and the Young Child Tax Credit. Thank you so much. I think before you say anything, Anna, I think I, I want to thank Controller Yi. I think, you know, hearing your insight, it's so uh, such a breath of fresh air, right? I love that we have somebody who like understands the struggle of like real Californians, right? And that's what we want when we are making like policies and we're talking about things like what's happening at the level of Grand Hanks Tax Board. So thank you so much. Absolutely. So, yeah, Anna, how about you? What do you think that we can do to help, um, you know, empower families? You know, I don't have a whole lot more to add. I think um, the, the other women on this panel really spoke to it. Um, the only piece that I would add, because it's what I always add, is the advocacy angle, which is tell electeds what you need. Your voice is powerful. Uh, and so if you are not getting your needs met, that is something that you can communicate to your elected officials, both at the state and local level. Share your story just like Rachel did. It's impactful. It matters. It makes people change their mind. It makes them think differently um, if they need to be. Um, and, and that's just a way to really um, empower yourself, empower your community, um, and, uh, and, and ultimately build that, that um, you know, financial resiliency that we want for everybody. Andy, can I just jump in on raise something really, really important, and that is um, to hear stories from Rachel and other Californians that really are embedded in the lived experiences that they have every day just means that the policies are going to be that much uh, better uh, in terms of delivering results that work, because so much of the time policies are put in place that really are hard to really get the kind of outcomes that we want. And uh, but thank you, Anna, for saying that, because advocacy is really about uh, lifting your voice and to be sure that the policies are put in place are really going to deliver, you know, outcomes that are going to provide improvements in your life. So thank you. I, I just want to say quickly, thank you to all of you and all the work that you do, because no one person can do it all by themselves, and that's why we're all in it together. So thank you also. Thank you all so much. Thank you, uh, Controller uh, Betty He, Rachel, and Anna for joining our uh, first section of the panel. We appreciate your time and sharing all your expertise with us today. So in our uh, second section, we are going to be hosting Senator Caballero and Eduardo from the Latino Community Foundation. We are so excited to have you. And I think um, while we wait for people to get logged on, I actually want to ask Rachel the same question that I asked Anna and Controller Yee earlier. And the question was, how can we support Californians to reach their financial goals and feel empowered? I would love to hear your perspective as a community member. What do you think? I, I think with all the resources that are out there, continue to, you know, always advertise on every level that is possible to reach everyone, to let them know that they're not alone and that there are people there that can support them. They just need to speak up use the resources and pass on the information so that people know that they can make it with the different resources that are out there. You know, even though we are all going through the pandemic, um, the state has and the government has helped as much as they can. But now, you know, it's all new to all of us, but we can't give up. We got to just be there for one another and know that Helping one another is what is going to make the difference. And that's what I have to say about that. And just hang in there because we can do it. We can do it. Thank you so much, Rachel. So I want to introduce you all to Eduardo Garcia, who is from the Latino Community Foundation, who's doing amazing things across the state with the Latino community. And I think what we'll do is we're going to open it up with a question for you. And so um, what are some of the barriers that our Latino community members are facing when it comes to filing their taxes or getting the credits that they, de they deserve? Thank you so much, Mandy, for that question. And thank you for the invitation to be a part of this panel. 
Um, yeah, so as you mentioned, there's a lot of work to be done to ensuring that Latinos are accessing the California Earned Income Tax Credit. But obviously that starts with removing barriers that exist uh, for Latinos to file their taxes in the first place. So for example, many Latinos are unaware that um, there are free options to file your taxes, right? And that's simply due to lack of education around the process. Um, you know, Latinos can go, and anyone, right? Any Californian can go to myfreetaxes.org to file both their state and federal taxes. Uh, and so you don't have to necessarily go to a prepare uh, and pay out of pocket for these services. Uh, and many Latinos aren't aware that they can go to VITA sites, right? These volunteer income tax assistance sites to get that one-on-one -on -one assistance that they need to, to file their taxes, to ask questions about the process that can sometimes be intimidating for folks, especially if you're filing for the first time. Um, another issue around education is simply not knowing what benefits you might be able to claim um, or that these benefits are even available to you, you know, even if you aren't earning that much money. Um, so as you mentioned, the California Earned Income Tax Credit recently became available to all tax filers, regardless of their immigration status, if they're income eligible. Um, and so that's a relatively new policy. And there's a lot of work to be done within the Latino community to ensuring that there's accurate, reliable, and trustworthy information available about these benefits. Um, and so it really underscores the importance of community-based organizations that have the trust of the community to, to overcome some of these hurdles to apply uh, to uh, claiming uh, these tax credits, which starts with filing taxes. And so I, I would summarize those as, as those being some of the some of the barriers and some of the potential solutions. Thank you so much. And I want to uh, welcome Senator Ana Caballero. Um, she's just joined us and we're talking a lot about, you know, some of the barriers that, you know, uh, not just tax filers are facing, but especially our Latino community. And uh, Senator Caballero, can you um, tell us your thoughts on how can we make tax filing and accessing tax credits more accessible? And maybe what are some of the changes you would like to see? Well, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you here today. It's, um, it's always great to be able to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Um, first of all, um, you know that one of the reasons that it's really important to have trusted messengers out in the community, and I wanna recognize the foundation and Eduardo for the hard work they do in the Latino community, is to have someone that you trust to ask questions about. And, um, um, there is a natural hesitancy to engage with the government among the Latino community for a whole variety of reasons. And so uh, having an organization you can go to is really important. So number one is that people don't understand that they really um, should be filing a tax return and that there are benefits to doing that. There are potential benefits to doing that, like the young uh, childhood credit uh, tax credit and the um, earned income tax credit. Those are really important resources that put puts money in the pockets of families, um, individuals and families. And filling out a very, very simple tax form will, will provide you the opportunity to see if you're eligible. Um, and, and, um, and as I said, they're really important to reduce poverty. So first it's community education, and then it's having um, the resources available in every single community to help people fill out their income taxes. One of the things we discovered is that even with all of that available, many, many people do not access or, or don't file their, their taxes. And so um, I ran a bill a couple of years ago asking the Franchise Tax Board to uh, analyze what we could do to help people access these tax credits. Um, and they just came out with a report and we're starting to study it a little bit more carefully. We've spent millions of dollars to educate the community and to give them information, but um, people are still not taking advantage of the credits. Yeah, and I wanna go back to a point that Senator Caballero just made a little bit ago around 
the California Earned Income Tax Credit, the Young Child Tax Credit. These are tax credits that are specific to the state of California. And I think what's also so exciting about them is people who have an ITIN are eligible for these. And this is really exciting because those with ITINs are often left out of uh, federal tax credit. So they're usually not able to get the federal earned income, income tax credit or they weren't able to get the federal stimulus. And so I think it's so exciting that somebody with an ITIN who's working just as hard, they're paying their taxes, that they get some of that money back. And one of the things that we're hearing a lot is, you know, generally it's supposed to take six to 12 weeks to get an, an, your ITIN application back and get your ITIN number. But we're hearing stories that people are waiting up to a year to get um, their number and their paperwork to go through. Senator Caballero, can you tell us a little bit more about this and why this is happening? So um, the I-10 is extremely important if you're going to be working um, in order to um, document the, your earnings as well as um, you know money that you can get get back from your earnings. Um, it is a federal number that's given um, through the um, Internal Revenue Service, the IRS. Unfortunately, because of a whole series of things, one of which happens to be this COVID pandemic. Um, th things going through the government services right now are taking longer, just like restaurants and stores that have been affected, uh, government has been affected as well. And so it is, it, it, it's supposed to take no longer than seven weeks, um, but our, my understanding is that it's now taking almost a year and uh, the state of California is working very closely with the federal government to see if we can help expedite this process, um, understanding that people really need to get that number in order to be able to file their taxes and be able to continue working. So it, it is something that hopefully will um, become quicker over time, but mm -hmm. it is in the hands of the federal government right now. So it's a little bit difficult. Yeah, we appreciate your support with that. Um, Eduardo, I'm going to turn it back to you real quick. Um, tax credits like the Cali ITC and the Golden State Stimulus have been proven to help families move up the economic ladder. Um, your organization is one of the many organizations in the Cali ITC Coalition, and you guys have really helped, you know, ensure that these um, funds are available to community members, especially those who have an ITIN. Can you uh, tell me your thoughts on why do you think it's so important that we increase accessibility to tax credits like the Cali ITC? Yes, yes, Mandy, thank you for that question. You know, as you mentioned earlier, um, the Cali ITC is a state level tax credit that's available to all income eligible tax filers, regardless of their immigration status. Um, we know that tax filers that file with ITINs um, that don't that are not currently eligible for a social security number contribute on average of three billion dollars each year in state and local taxes right and so these are folks that are contributing to the state's safety net and are often unfortunately unable to access some of the benefits that the state provides to those families that are experiencing economic hardship uh, we know that during the pandemic, that was especially pronounced within the Latino community. A lot of folks experienced uh, the brunt of the pandemic within the Latino community. Uh, and that includes rural, indigenous, low income immigrant communities. And so it was really important for us to advocate so that Latino uh, and, and immigrant folks that file uh, their taxes with a NICAN could also access some of these benefits for some of the reasons you mentioned earlier. The federal government, when it was providing some of this uh, relief, economic relief for working families uh, across the country excluded uh, ITIN filers. And so that means that families missed out on thousands of dollars in relief that could have really helped them stay afloat during the economic hardship that many families have experienced over the past couple of years. And so this is about an, uh, having an, an opportunity to recover equitably as we emerge from the pandemic. And that includes ensuring that the most vulnerable, including folks that file taxes with I-10, can access the Cali ITC. Thank you so much, Eduardo. And I think you bring up such a great point, right? It's about 
you know, people pay taxes, they work really hard, they are contributing to our economy. And not only that, you know, as uh, controller Yi mentioned, you know, in the first 15 minutes is that, you know, we, we need to help families move up the economic ladder, right? And this money is really important. It's a, it plays a really important role in helping people get out of poverty and not just through COVID, but uh, through all sorts of different disparities that you know, people are facing in their communities. Um, as we wrap up this section, I have uh, one more question for you, Senator Caballero. And it's the same question I'm gonna ask everybody throughout the session. And it's how can we support Californians to reach their financial goals and feel empowered during the process? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I think what's really important is, and I wanna um, really thank Rachel for her comments, is that um, outreach and education is really important. We have some really important resources out there that'll help families. And if they don't know about it, then they're, they're, not, they're not going to the people who really need it the most. And so, I um, want to thank organizations like United Way and the uh, Latino Foundation because they really do tremendous outreach, number one. Number two is that it's important that people advocate on their behalf so that the more that we can hear the voices of um, individuals and, and mem uh, members of, that have family members, um, that we hear their voice and we know how we can, be, we can help them to be successful. And, um, and that includes not only our state elected officials, that have included um, undocumented workers in as many programs as we as we fund ourselves, but also our federal representatives who need to hear from um, the undocumented as well. Many of the programs that they uh, pass exclude um, exclude them whether they're working or not. And um, and then finally, um, it's really important that um, that we we lift everybody um, with whatever policies that that we adopt. Um, I'm critically aware of, of, um, of the needs in the community and the more help I get to be able to, to uh, bring others along with me, the better it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the theme here, we heard the same thing in the first, uh, first quarter of our, of our, um, seminar is that, you know, reach out to your elected officials, tell them your story. I think that there's this misconception that letters don't get read and that's absolutely not true. There are staff members that make sure that those emails get read, uh, the letters get read. And so if you guys are interested in finding out, well, who is my elected official? How do I get in touch with them? If you go to our Instagram, which is United Way CA, and you go to our link tree, our link tree actually has an option to find your elected official. And so it'll have the email, how you get in touch with them. So if you're curious and you're like, oh, I don't know where to start, that's a really great and easy way to start. So um, Senator Caballero, thank you so much uh, for coming and giving your time and your thoughts. Eduardo, same to you. Thank you. So uh, for our third section coming up, I'm so excited to introduce Senator Rubio. We also have Amy Everett from Golden State Opportunity. And then we have our VITA volunteer extraordinaire, Carlotta Diaz, who is coming to us from um, United Way Capital Region, which is up in the Sacramento area. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having us. Yeah. Not to be here. Yeah, thank you. So excited to have you. So Senator Rubio, I'll start off with you. There are so many people who don't file their taxes, yet they are the ones that stand to make the most from the tax credit, um, from tax credits. Uh, what would you tell someone who doesn't uh, want to do their taxes or doesn't think uh, it's necessary for them to do it? Well, before I give them advice, I first want to start by acknowledging some of the reasons why they don't file, which are obvious to me, but perhaps not a lot of people. Uh, what people don't know is that I was an accountant at one point for five years and and just the intricacy and how difficult it is to navigate forms and file, that alone can scare anyone into wanting to file their taxes. But there's another issue that's more prominent these days that I think is really scaring at least our immigrant community from filing. Uh, and I have to share uh, being a formerly undocumented individual who was deported as a child, I can share that the trauma that our immigrant communities have suffered is paralyzing. Um, you know, by way of example, I have to share my father has been a US citizen for I believe 30 years and that fear never goes away. So there's this fear more than ever. And I would say in this era of bipartisan you know, rhetoric, uh, it's uh, this fear that if they file their taxes, 
the government somehow is tracking them. And I say that because we've had people call my office asking um, if they file taxes, what happens with the information? Will they get deported? So there's a real concern there, not for themselves. We have mixed uh, status households. So they think that, um, for example, you can be a US citizen, but your wife or, or, or children are not. And so I wanted to start by acknowledging some of the things that are happening. And uh, so what would I say to them? And I think I heard the tail end of your conversation is uh, we have to um, reach out to our local electeds. I'm able to help personally navigate these situations individually when they come to our office. Uh, they feel a little bit more comfortable uh, hearing it from someone like myself or local leaders, um, or wherever you're from, uh, there's people wanting to help and they're available. What I would say is, you know, look for opportunities um, in your communities. I know that I've partnered uh, in the past and have been able to have workshops on, on how to get your taxes done. Um, so it's education a lot of the times, but I would say, please file. Uh, this is money that is due to you. This is money that will help your, your families. And uh, it is only, uh, you know, fitting that you get that benefit. And so uh, please don't be afraid. Uh, if you are, are, if you have uh, money coming to you, it's yours, you earned it. And so don't be afraid, look for the information, look for the help and look for those workshops where they can help navigate some of these complicated uh, forms that, like I said, even as an accountant, I can share it is overwhelming and a little bit scare, scary. So I'll just say, please uh, go get help. We're here to help. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your personal experiences. And I think they're really relatable, right? I think we have a lot of families who are feeling terrified. Like you said, it's, it's paralyzing. The last thing you want is to be separated from your family. And I think, you know, it reminds me of a common question we get asked a lot is, well, I'm going to get money back um, for a tax credit. Is it going to be considered a public charge? And I think this is really important to reiterate to families that it is not considered a public charge. It's money that you're already paying out of your paycheck every month, and it's money that belongs to you. So um, I, I want to kind of follow up with that. And I'm going to uh, follow up with you, Amy, from Golden State Opportunities. And you know, talking about reaching families, and we're talking about trusted messengers, and you know ensuring that we reaching that we reach families and we tell them about these tax credits is really an essential part of this process. Is there anything that we can do to ensure that families capture all the credits that they deserve? Absolutely. And thank you so much. Um, and I kind of hate to sound like a broken record, but everyone really does need to file their taxes and to tell their family and their friends, their neighbors, the folks you wave at everybody, the people at the grocery store, to file their taxes because the government has decided that this is the vehicle they're going to use to help give people the monetary resources they need to help them get by. Um, GSO, um, Golden State Opportunity, works with organizations on the ground that help help people file and we'll run out, we're going to be running ads on TV and radio and search. Um, but as Senator Rubio mentioned, it really is word of mouth from the most trusted messengers. Um, you, everyone who is on this call and listening, you are a trusted messenger in your community. And that's why it's really important to hear from, to talk about what's at stake. Um, there are thousands of dollars at stake for families and to encourage people to go to all the resources we've talked about, the VITA sites, the United Ways, the CaliITCForMe.org, um, so that everybody has a chance to do their taxes and claim these credits. Yeah, and Amy, you bring, bring up such a great point. It's VITA. So VITA is a great example of trusted messengers who are on the ground. So VITA stands for Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. And I'm actually going to be asking one of our volunteers a question in a little bit. But it's really important to know that VITA is 100% volunteer ran. These are people who live in your community. They're probably your neighbor who are actually doing your taxes. And more so, they're doing this because they care about it and they love it. You know, I love meeting our VITA volunteers and they tell me, I am so passionate about taxes. I am so passionate about this work. And when I get to make sure that they walk away with every single tax credit they deserve, it makes me feel so good. And so I want to introduce you all to Carlotta Diaz. Carlotta Diaz is a VITA volunteer in the Capital Region area, which is near Sacramento um, in California. And so, you know, we hear a lot, VITA is so important. It's this free way that people can file their taxes for free. 
Carlotta, can you tell me how long have you been a VITA volunteer and what do you love so much about it? Yes, hi, thank you for the opportunity of um, doing this. I, I think it's very important for us to let the people know that uh, we can do their taxes for free. I have been a volunteer for over 23, 25 years. And um, uh, what gives me the passion to help people is because um, a lot of them, they don't have the, the resources, they don't have the money to go to a paid um, CPA to do their taxes. Uh, with the new credits uh, that we are getting right now, the um, uh, earned income credit that has doubled up, the, um, uh, the uh, care tax credit, which is getting half when it wasn't done before. So getting all these credits to people, helping them, um, getting and asking them to get the word around so that they can come to us. What gives me the passion to help people is that we can do it and it's for free. You don't need to put money in somebody else's pocket when you can do it with us, the, the volunteers. We, as volunteers, we have to pass every single year. We have to take the test from the IRS. We have to be certified by the IRS. So we all have the knowledge to do your, the taxes for free. Thank you so much, Carlotta. You know, I'm curious, you know, I, what would you tell someone who's maybe they're curious about interest, uh, uh, volunteering and becoming a VITA volunteer, but they're like, well, I'm not a CPA. I don't know anything about taxes. What would you tell them? <laughs> Actually, I just got asked that question and I tell them, go to irs.gov one or two, go to United Way and um, also get go to uh, getyourrefund.com and it will give you some idea on how to uh, log in, how to apply to become a volunteer. When you go to the irs.gov, there is a link and learn uh, website that you go in and that's where you start taking the uh, classes then um, that will take you to your site or an area close to you so that you can volunteer as a VITA rep. Thank you so much. So long story short, you don't need to be a tax expert. They will train you, they'll support you, they will help you. The IRS will train you and also, you know, your local United Way or whatever VITA site that you're helping out at, they will help support you during that process. And thank you so much. I mean, a volunteer for over 20 years, I mean, that's really... Amazing. <laughs> Thank amazing, you. Amazing, amazing. Um, Senator Rubio, in the short period of time um, that we saw those advanced uh, child tax credit payments going out, we saw a huge reduction in child poverty and child hunger. It was really incredible to see. How do you think we can use that model of the advanced payments as a model for future programming? Well, first of all, I think it's so important that we continue this model in future programming. Um, I just happened to have read an article recently, I think it was a, the New York Times, and it really does talk about, it was a study that showed that cash assistance to low income mothers really increases the brain activity in children and the, their outcome and development. So when you think of the correlation here, it is so vital that we make sure it continues to happen. Um, I'm also very um, encouraged by Governor Newsom who is prioritizing this and putting a lot of funding into this. Uh, I, I think that uh, as leaders, we need to continue to push forward. Uh, it is absolutely necessary. Uh, as we know, this pandemic will have generational effects. It's going to continue to trickle down. It's not something that's going to just happen now. We're going to be out of it and things are going to go back to normal. I think we need to continue this model and continue assisting on a consistent basis moving forward to ensure that we get these children that are growing up in poverty and have so much food insecurity, you know, a fighting chance because what happens to them now, and I say that as a teacher, a 17 year veteran teacher, and I myself had to buy food for children sometimes when they come home, I'm sorry, to the classroom hungry. I know how important it is for children to grow up in a safe home where they have food and housing. And so it is our responsibility. So I hope that we can continue to press the governor to make this a priority, not just this year, but moving forward. 
Yeah, I agree. I think what's been so exciting about the advanced payments that people were able to get from July to December, I think I heard that just in that first month in July, that child hunger was reduced in half, which is incredible and crazy. And it also kind of breaks my heart because what it means is families aren't spending money on crazy stuff. It means that they are spending money on food for their families. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And, and like I shared, I was a teacher for 17 years and I mean, it breaks my heart as an elected leader, but you know, I saw it firsthand. It's just a ground zero where some of my families were sleeping in cars. I mean, it, that was very devastating for me as a person personally. And uh, when our kids wouldn't uh, start writing and I would ask why, and they would say, Miss Rubio, my tummy hurts, I'm hungry. And so as you can imagine, um, that's really why I decided at some point to run for state center because there's so much need out there and, uh, and we need to make sure that these um, families have the support system they need and to help our future generations. So, so I'm happy to be here and, and participate and make sure that we work together to, to get these children what they need. Thank you so much. And I think we probably have time for about one more question, Senator Rubio. Um, and I'll ask you the same question, Amy, is how can we support Californians to reach their financial goals and feel empowered during the process? Well, again, it goes back a little bit to, to the educational factor here. And so we need to invest in education. We need to invest in outreach. Um, you know, going back to my original comment, uh, there's a lot of families that would mix household status as it pertains to immigration. And, and so it doesn't only affect those that are undocumented, but it affects the entire family as a whole. So we need to make sure that we give them the confidence to, to come out of the shadows. And as you pointed out, um, one of you ladies said, uh, trusted messengers. I mean, it doesn't get better than your local electeds, your your, your um, you know, priests, you know, people that you trust, our community organizations. I think collectively we have to do what we can to, to make sure that we are putting the information at their fingertips, but more importantly, giving them the confidence to know that we're not going to report them or our goal is to harm them, but rather to help them. So I hope that we continue to do this. Um, and I do have a, a bill that I was started last year moving forward that's going to help also those that don't have income. A lot of the times those that stay home that don't have income are at, at, at a disadvantage because they don't file taxes based on a, a natural job, but they're caretakers. And so we want to make sure that they're taken care of. So uh, the bill that I started last year, uh, which I will continue this year, and I saw that the governor has the intent to, to be supportive, is that we will bring down the, the earned income to, from $1 to zero. So those that are staying at home also benefit because we can't forget about those. We don't want to penalize them for being at state, you know, staying at home and taking care of their families. So hopefully that would help. Thank you so much, Senator Rubio. We really appreciate you, you know, uh, advocating for all of us here in California. And um, I love this idea around bringing that income down to zero. Thank you so much. So Amy, how about you? How do you think we could help support Californians to reach their financial goals? Yeah, that's a great question, Mandy. Thank you. And, you know, I'm a really big believer that just having more money helps build financial stability. So that is really step one, helping people claim these tax credits. Um, both at the state and the federal level so that they can start to build their financial stability. And I know a lot of people think it's more complicated than that. The tax return is one way to get more money back in your pocket. Um, but it's also important for, for folks to know that money isn't going to impact public benefit or the public charge rule, which doesn't even exist anymore. N none of this applies to your tax returns. When you fill out your taxes and you get these refunds and you get these tax credits, they do not impact your income because it's money you've already earned. Um, so I think one of the best ways to help Californians reach their financial goals is getting their taxes done, getting the money that they've already earned in their pockets now so they can create the financial stability to make great financial decisions moving forward. One thing that we saw in Stockton when there was the universal basic income practice was that folks who just had $500 more a month were able to apply for and wait for better paying jobs. And so it overwhelmingly helped them create the financial stability we want all Californians to have. So this money can be the beginning of it and it can lead to, to better decisions. 
Thank you so much. I just want to thank again, Senator Rubio and Amy Everett from Golden State Opportunity and Carlotta, our VITA volunteer for joining us today. Uh, we thank really you. appreciate your support and your time. Well, thank, thank you for you. having us here. Really appreciate what you're doing as well. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. So, in our last section, we have California State Treasurer Fiona Ma. We are so excited to have her. We also have Suzanne Harris, who's one of our partners at United Way uh, Wine Country. Um, we are so excited to ask you some more questions, really um, not just about taxes, but really kind of taking this idea of helping families become financially empowered. And how do we do that like holistically at like um, a bigger level? So. Treasurer Ma, I will start with you. What role do tax credits like the Cali ITC have in communities? Yeah, so I've been a, a tax accountant at CPA since 2002, licensed in the state of California. So I've been doing a lot of VITA outreach, um, you know, Cal grants, Cali ITC, and it is great to see United Way take a leadership role, even virtually in these times to get the message out. And as many of the speakers said earlier, a lot of people don't know that they're eligible for these credits because they don't owe taxes. And so when you go to a volunteer site, um, they may not go uh, or somebody that's not as educated may say, well, you don't owe taxes. So, you know, um, why are you here? So understanding that you cannot get your tax credits unless you file your taxes is so super important, right? So you should go and make sure it's a free filing site. So many people have signs out that say, uh, come, we can help you get your, you know, Cali ITC and federal tax credits, you know, and then once you do your tax returns, then they charge you for it or they take part of that refund. And so this is also a time to let people know, ask a question. Is this really free? Are you gonna do my tax preparation for free, right? I see Rachel nodding her head and Carlotta. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people fall under this trap. So I would also say when you get this money back, it could be up to $10,000, don't spend it. Let's save it, right? Even during the pandemic for the last two years, we have seen more Californians put their money into different savings programs and I've got three that I'd love to talk about um, and let that money build, right? Uh, earn interest and in another 10 or 15 or 20 years, now you have a little nest egg for retirement or for your child's education. So let me know when you want me to talk about some of my savings programs. Oh, we definitely will, Treasure Ma, don't worry. <laughs> Next, I'm gonna ask Suzanne Harris. Uh, Suzanne Harris is one of our partners from United Way Wine Country. They are also one of our Vita sites, but they do a lot more than that. And Suzanne, um, of the estimated 3.5 million households in California that be below, fall below the real cost measure, 97% of them have at least one working adult. So we know that just because you're working, it might not really be enough to get by. Can you tell us about your experience working with community, mem community members in your region? Yeah, we, I mean, this is a whole series we could do on these, um, just yeah. the storytelling alone. And I know Pete knows I'm, I'm, my favorite part of this job is collecting the stories. My favorite part of the job is being on the ground and listening. Um, incentivizing savings, um, doing the social emotional work of really meeting our clients where they're at. So it's well and good that we have these expanded credits and all these opportunities and we digitize everything. Really, we have learned that I'm not the content expert. The content expert is my client on her own life. And Rachel, you know, I'm listening to the clients. So I need to know what have your barriers been, right? Uh, Dr. Tarai Trent is my favorite author. Um, and she uh, used to talk about the baton of poverty. So it didn't just start with my client. The baton of poverty came through generations and generations. And that education is the only way to turn that baton of poverty into the baton of prosperity. Um, and we see so much entrepreneurial spirit coming out of the Latino community specifically. Um, it's just been amazing what's been happening with the clients. And I think that, um, you know, our average filer here, although we say 66,000 is our limit, our average filer is 28,000 combined household income in Sonoma County. And we go all the way up, you know, Humboldt, Mendocino, Del Norte. 
Um, so if they're struggling because, for instance, a family, I had a guy in here yesterday who was a driver, uh, a food driver, and then he got sick and his wife, because the kids were mandated to do homeschooling, had to leave a $35 an hour job to stay home. So both incomes disappeared overnight and they lost their apartment. Um, they moved into someplace else that had a fire. They were living on the insurance money. It was just, it went from doing okay, but still struggling with two parent households. It wasn't enough in the beginning. It got worse in the end. And when they came in here yesterday and got a $12,000 refund, we got to talk about a refund's not enough, you know, and I, I love what Fiona Ma said and, and what Carlotta was talking about. It's not enough. And if you don't educate behind the lump sum payment, if we don't have more advocacy and more for support for programs where we listen to them, they're the content experts of their own life, what do you need? Um, wouldn't it be great to wake up tomorrow and have your childcare payment or your car payment already in savings to really actualize what it feels like to save, what it feels like. If we don't take down the stress of these families, they're always going to be in chaos. There's going to be no financial change. It doesn't matter how big their refund is. So I would you know, advocate for anything that helps these families realize that we're here to help them and we need to remove the challenges. So they don't, they don't have a computer, they don't have a printer, they don't maybe know how to go onto the internet and, and track these resources on their own. So it's the tax appointment is the gateway to really help them lift up themselves when crisis hits. Um, and so our experience has been, you know, I have hundreds of stories from our clients, if anybody ever wants them, um, with the pictures and the advocacy of what did they do with their refund and how did we, how did we encourage that respectfully, understanding that it's unrealistic to just put it all in savings when you've got the house burning down? So I think to, you know, the both and is really important, but to continue that relationship with them, um, to listen to their stories. I know Pete knows that we entered, I wrote the story for one of our clients um, for the Save Your Refund, and she won $25,000 as the national winner. And with that, she got to go back to school and get her dream job as a nurse. And it happened at our tax site. And she stayed in contact with us after that. So these stories are real. And I think the, the tax return and the different things that we have through our trusted messengers, I'm not always the best messenger. I get to, I get to fund all these <laughs> wonderful organizations who know how to communicate the fears and listen in their language um, to what they need. I can get out of I can get out of the way and empower others to do that, whether it's the client or our trusted organizations. And we found a lot of tricks and trades on how to make that happen. So it's, it's connection. And it's really just helping our clients see the next stair instead of looking at the entire staircase. Yeah. Um, and, and we can do that. Thank you so much for sharing that, Suzanne. And I think, you know, this recurring theme is we're talking about education, 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 right? Like you said, the VITA and the tax credits, it's the its the door, right? That's the first step. And then what's next? I always say, you don't know what you don't know, right? So being able to support our community members and educate them, not only about different programs and services, but like what's next, right? And I think what's really amazing is the state of California is really taking this very seriously. And um, I want Treasurer Ma to talk a little bit about, you know, how are we helping families save for retirement, save for college, right? It's not just about tax credits. Um, what are some of the things that the state of California is doing around this, Treasurer Ma? Yeah, so I have three savings programs that I administer under my office. Uh, the lo longest one is Scholar Share 529. And that is really to encourage parents and grandparents to save for their child's education, keep them out of high student loan debt. And I use the latte example. If you forego one latte a week and that $10, right, um, you know, a day, latte a day, and you put $100 into your scholar share 529 at about 6% interest over 18 years, that $100 would turn into something like $65,000 with compounding interest. And that's not a lot of money, like Suzanne said. Let's look at the stair versus the staircase. Let's put in $25 a paycheck, right? If you could do a little bit more. Second program, they're a little bit newer, Cal Savers. 
if you work for an employer that does not provide a retirement savings account and they hire more than five people, they will be mandated to upload their roster to CalSAVERS and through automatic deductions through their payroll, they will also start saving for retirement. And this is similar to a Roth IRA. So it is post-tax, but it is there for a rainy day. And that's the, that's the purpose. The last one is Cal Able. If you are diagnosed with a disability before the age of 26 years old, you can now save up to $15,000 in that person's name without jeopardizing the other life and safety benefits. And this is really creating independence, a sense of financial security and safety for these individuals, because many of them, their parents are concerned about their child. How are they going to make it, right? How are they going to survive? And they weren't able to save any money under their name. They couldn't inherit the house. And now Cal Abel is going to make a difference. And I just want to also, Mandy, I'll have a sec give a second. Uh, yeah and the legislature has put in an unprecedented amount for ch child's poverty. So this summer, if you have a newborn born after July 1st, they will automatically get an account with $25 in it. If they sign up for ScholarShare and link their payroll, they will get an additional uh, amount. In addition, for every first and first through 12th grader, in a public school that is on free reduced lunch, they will get $500 into a scholarship account. If they are a foster youth, they will get another $500. And if they are homeless, they will get another $500. So this is real money. It's going to be coming. You all may get um, questions from your constituents saying, I got a letter from the government, free money for our children. Is this real? Is it a scam? Yes, it's real. And we're going to be rolling it out over the next six months. So look forward to that. I am so excited to hear that. I mean, when I think about $500 going into a, an account, that's, you know, books for a semester, right? It's yeah. your parking pass. It's making car payments. It's these different things that are going to help people be successful when they graduate or when they're in college. I love that. I can't wait to see that. So I think we probably have time for one more question. So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, you, Treasurer Ma, and then I'll ask you as well, Suzanne, how can we support Californians to reach their financial goals and feel empowered during the process? Yeah, like many of the speakers said, you know, get involved. I know it's scary. People don't know what to do. They may feel intimidated, but we are here to help, right? United Way, other organizations are trying to lift people up. Um, and so take advantage of every free opportunity. And most of these programs are free, right? And you just have to get over that, you know, that hump of, you know, like, I don't know, I'm scared. Um, you know, I don't want to sign up or maybe the government's going to come after me. Like these are free programs. Empower yourself, take advantage of them. Yep. I would say, I would say that's absolutely right. I think um, it's also relationship building. It's, you know, we do so much strategic thinking and big picture developing, and that's great, but you have to be out the door and out into the community. You have to attend Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. You have to go to, you know, low-income neighborhoods and go to their events. And, and you have to, you know, the biggest compliment I got today was that I, ha I was actually in my heart, I'm actually Latina. All right, that was the biggest compliment I've had because I'm in the community all the time. And I, I'm reminding them that their, their stories matter. I'm turning them into advocates. We took that $25,000 winner to Sacramento and she told her story about being DACA and what it was like to actually join Facebook with her real name. And she became a, a terror. She was amazing. And it happened from the tax site on what she believed was possible. You cannot, you cannot be hiding behind the fact that you, you know, so many of our clients say, I don't want, I don't want that extra money because I think someone else needs it more than me. And research has shown that low-income people are least likely to take advantage of these benefits. And part of it is because they always think someone else is worse off than them. So it's, it's really just meeting them where they are at and asking them what they need and how we can help and then go to work there um, instead of just forcing every single program on them. And, and you know they're so used to just being a number in the system. They're so used to being defeated. 
and when you remind them that their stories matter and we need them as much as they need us, the connection happens, the relationship happens. And when a relationship happens, everything's possible. Thank you so much. You know, I, I really, really appreciate all of our panelists that came today. Again, we had State Controller Betty Yee. Um, we had Senator Caballero, Senator Rubio, uh, California State Treasurer Fiona Ma. We also had, um, you know, the Latino Community Foundation, Golden State Opportunity, uh, United Way partners and advocates. We are so, so lucky to have your time, your expertise and hear your stories. I think, you know, there are a couple things we want to make sure that you do file your taxes, file them for free. Please go to myfreetaxes.org. There's three different ways to file for free. You can find um, in-person help. So you could search our map and try to find an appointment near you. If you're not near a VITA site, you can actually file virtually with a VITA volunteer and do everything over your phone or your computer. And the last is you could do it on your own as well, which is actually not as hard as you think it is. Our software walks you through every single step and they ask you really basic questions. So we encourage you to all visit myfreetaxes.org. Don't pay someone to do your taxes. We want to make sure that you capture all the credits that um, are possible. And I just want to remind everyone, if you were getting those advanced child tax credit payments from July to December, if you want those remaining half of your payments, you need to file your taxes, okay? So the tax deadline is uh, Monday, April 18th this year. So make sure that you guys go and file. Uh, we appreciate everybody's support and um, we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you.